Okay, I'm going to try to use some images and numbers to characterize the healthcare industry, the system, if you will. Now, I don't expect you to memorize these numbers. On the other hand, if you're in the healthcare profession, it seems like you ought to have some concept of the size of your profession and the system that you work in. You know, I'm nearly, I'm one of nearly 3 million registered nurses in the country and one of about 24,000 in Arkansas. Seems like it's important to have a sense for that for several reasons. You know, this might help me make decisions about what profession to choose in the first place or where opportunities for employment lie, um, maybe. But more importantly, I think I'm probably going to be more conscientious as a nurse, you know, more thoughtful if I understand my role as it fits in the scheme of things. The American Nurses Association, for example, asked me to vote on a lot of things. They tell me, you should vote on this, you should vote on that because for nurses. Well, if I understand how nursing fits in, into the scheme of things, then I can take that account when I make a decision to vote on one policy or another. That is, I don't necessarily want to vote for something that's good for nurses. If I can see that in the system, voting for it would hurt some other necessary profession or most of all patients, right, or public health. So we want to take all those things into consideration when we're thinking about our profession. Now your book includes this chapter in a section called System Resources. I'm going to ask you to think about whether or not people who work in healthcare are resources or drivers of the system. You know, are we healthcare professionals resources or beneficiaries of the system? Now I want you to think about this, not because I think the book is wrong, but I think it's important to understand how perspective matters. From an in industry perspective, employees are resources, human resources we call it, right? But from another, say, stakeholder's perspective or from the patient's perspective or from a perspective of a disinterested member of the public, we may see physicians or nurses as something other than a resource because resources don't usually make decisions. People do. So keep that in mind as we go through here. So chapter four lays a lot of statistics and lists on you, help you get a sense for the size and scope of the healthcare industry. Here we're going to look at a couple of websites, statehealthfacts.org, the Kaiser Family Foundation, which is kff.org, and the Bureau for Labor Statistics, which is bls.gov. I'm going to show you a few statistics here, but what I really want you to get at is how to use these and make sure you know they're there in case you need them. Now, hospitals are the largest employer of people in healthcare. There's about 5,000 hospitals in the country. Arkansas has about 70, 75, something like that. Now, the hospital association, the Arkansas Hospital Association, that is, is an organization worth keeping your eye on. Well, I mean, keeping up with. You know, since they're pretty influential in the design of our system, at least locally. Now, representatives from the hospital association show up at a lot of the meetings where decisions are being made. So I encourage you to check out their website, think about who they work for, you know, what's their mission, who are their principals, that is, who are the people that they are working for. Is it hospital administrators? Is it nurses? Is it patients? Is it the public? I think those are the important things to ask of any professional healthcare organization. Now they've got a good resource for facts and news. I thought it was a pretty good site for people to get information about Arkansas hospitals. It's called the Hospital Consumer Assist. It's a lot to be desired here, but it is a pretty good resource. I think you'll see this get better as transparency improves. Okay, so 17 million people work in healthcare, and healthcare accounts for about 10% of all employment. I want you to think about that in terms of health literacy. Because some of the experts in health literacy say that as many as 80 or 90 percent of people are not at an adequate level of health literacy that is not able to adequately navigate the healthcare system. So we've got 10 percent of the people who work in the healthcare industry and 90 percent of the people who can't 
speak the language of the healthcare industry. And I'm just wondering what you think about that. Okay, before we look at a few of the other numbers, and we're going to talk about specialization and maldistribution, I want to introduce you to a theoretical structure that may help you think about professionals from another perspective. Agency theory can give you a set of terms that may help you think about the foundation of a health system. Why do we have occupations, professions? Who are they supposed to be working for? What are they supposed to be doing? How do they get paid? How do we know that they're earning their pay? How do we know that they're doing something that benefits the people they're working for? So check this video out and see if it doesn't apply to some of the things that we talk about as we go really throughout this whole course. I think it's a good set of terminology for discussing systems and they're really health economic terms but I think I want to apply them to more things than health economics. I've been asked to talk to you a little bit about agency theory and governance. I gave you an article by Eisenhart where she says that agency theory is directed at the agency relationship in which one party, the principal, delegates work to another, the agent, who performs that work. Now, the article goes on to talk about some of the assumptions and, and some of the problems with those relationships. I'm not interested in, in you learning all of those. You know, some people make whole careers out of that, so you don't have to read the whole thing. But I think what's, what's important, the author asks us to consider the application of principal-agent structure to the world beyond uh, economics, which has a very narrow focus and some questionable assumptions about the nature of people and organizations. And so that's really what I want to do with, with in the next five minutes is not teach you all the nuances of principal agent theory, but just give you the language to apply to the things that we're going to talk about in this course. So I'm going to play around with some of these homemade icons to try to give you a sense for how I use these terms and how you might use these terms to talk about policy. Now in my examples, uh, you, you're going to see my bias and some of my assumptions are going to come through, but I ex fully expect you to question those, not just assume those. I kind of have to do that to tell you know to give my examples. But just look at how I apply the language of agency theory to a couple of problems. Now, I'm not trying to teach you anything about right and wrong or good and bad, but just some language for thinking about that as we go through these policies. Now, principles are the first term, right? Principles are people. Every individual is a principle. And then you have the environment that exists, and principles want to do something in or to the environment together. You know, if there's only two people, then we don't need an organization. We don't need an agent. Uh, these two principles just communicate to each other about what they do and what they want each other to do. But there's a lot more of us than two, and there's a lot of things we want to do. So we divide the labor up, and we organize. We hire agents to do work for us. And these can be individual agents or groups of agents, so we call them agencies or organizations. So these guys all talk to each other, and they decide to create an agent to work on something for them, you know, for their mutual benefit. I won't go into it now, but you'll want to think about how do principals pay agents, and how do... Um, they make sure that the agent is doing the work that the, that the principals ask them to do. Principals have a dialogue about why they need an agent and what they want the agent to do. They decide he should go get food. Uh, more specifically, they decide that the agent should go pick apples, bring them back to the group, to the principals. They talk about whether they want green or red, yellow, you know, ripe or rotten, and all those combinations or whatever. But they also have to talk about how much we're going to give this agent for doing that. What's it going to cost us to get this agent to do that? Okay, and you get the idea, right? This could be picking apples or building bridges or putting up road signs or whatever. Whatever the principals come up with that they decide is worth the price. Well, one potential problem with this relationship is that the agent can go off and start working in their own best interest instead of the best interest of the group, right? You know, they get out there and in the apple patch and they decide, <laughs> grow, whatever. They decide that the biggest apples um, should go in their own pocket and they don't tell us about them or they start picking pecans for themselves, putting them in their pockets while they're supposed to be picking apples and they keep the pecans or get, do something else with them. So you kind of get the idea. But that's called an autonomous agent. That's an agent that acts in the interest of the agent itself or the agency or the organization instead of in the interest of the principals. 
you know, one of the problems with this, these agencies are made up of principals who, you know, while they're on the clock, so to speak, they're working on behalf of the agency, right? We compensate them for that because they're, they're sacrificing some of their individual interests as principals to do the work of the agency or the agent you know, for, for the rest of us. And since they become experts in that task and they have more control over what the agency does, since they're right there, then the agency has a tendency to reflect their interests more than the people that they represent if the principals don't do a good job of tr keeping track of what the agents are doing, right? And I think that comes down to dialogue, communication between the principals and the agent. Another potential problem is when principals create an agency and some of the principals start to have more influence, you know, like stronger ties, more communication or whatever, than other principals. So what can happen is these three principals who don't think the agency is representing their interests very well decides, hey, we'll form our own agency uh, to represent us. And now, so now we have two agencies that, are, that have conflicting interests. So how do you resolve that? How do you justify that, that, that you now have principals working against principals? That's an interesting, you know, sort of a problem with this relationship. Um, now that's real brief, but I hope you kind of get the gist of how I'm trying to use these terms to look at the way organizations relate to the people they represent and that sort of thing. And so what I'd like you to do is, you know, in all these situations in policy, ask who is the principal and who is the agent and how well do they communicate and represent it like they're supposed to. Now one more complementary concept is governance. And I gave you an article from Stoker about governance. And again, you don't necessarily have to read it all, but the main point is that governance is more than the activities of government. It happens everywhere all the time. I mean, we govern ourselves around other principles, right? You know, we're polite. We don't say everything that comes into our mind <laughs> most of the time. We, if we do, we get in trouble. So we try to govern ourselves on that. But since there's a lot of principles, not just the two of us, then it becomes complicated. So we form agents like government to do some of the governing, do some of that governance for us. So I don't have to chase down everybody who speeds through my neighborhood and have a dialogue with them about how it's not in my best interest that they speed up and down my street. I delegate that authority to an agent, right, the government or police, to do that for me at some cost to me. But businesses are organizations too, and they use contracts to govern each other. Uh, some organizations govern government, you know, to keep an, an eye on government, make sure they're doing what they're supposed to do. Um, so you have all these agencies that govern each other, and then the principals are involved there. It gets really complicated, but I think the principal agent language can help you break that down and analyze some of these relationships. Now, Stoker's main point is that governance is not just something done by government, it's something that that's done everywhere. So so look for that. Look for how principals govern their agents, their organizations. In this class, you know, as these things come up, when we talk about the policy players or the special interest groups and those sort of things, think about who they represent, how well they're governed, and that sort of thing. Well, that was real quick. I hope we have some dialogue about this, and, you know, I'm open to emails and, and comments on how this went, but thanks for the opportunity. So I used that clip to talk to a health policy class, but really I think it applies here. So keep it in mind as we talk about the way professionals have developed, how we talk about the need for, for professionals, and the way professionals are governed. I think that's important. And this gets at the idea of moral hazard. You know, I, I asked you to look that up in the last lecture. Start thinking about it because usually moral hazard is talked about in terms of somebody being covered by insurance which removes them from the risk that they take day to day. So the moral hazard is really about accountability for your actions. But we want to hold agents of the system, you know, healthcare professionals and healthcare organizations and the healthcare system accountable for their behavior. Now they're responsible to the principal, and I think this principal agent structure helps you think about who are health professionals accountable to and where is the evidence that they are accountable to those people are there mechanisms in place that hold them accountable? And are there mechanisms in place that keep them from being accountable? It's important for us as we think about healthcare professionals, we want to think about the way they're governed. Do they govern themselves? Do patients govern? Can you tell who governs them? Does the public have a say in governing these guys? Are they self-governed? That sort of thing. So I'm going to leave it to you to look up more numbers, you know, look up some of the numbers in the profession that you see yourself working in or that you're already working in.
and be ready to discuss some of the numbers as they compare to other professions and that sort of thing. But I'm going to leave most of that to you in the book. I would like now to talk about specialization. So your book says that a specialist is a physician who specializes in one health problem, cardiology, etc. But it's not just physicians, right? There are specialties, specialty systems. We have centers for this and centers for that. Uh, so this specializing seems to be a pretty common thing that happens in systems. And it definitely has an impact on the way the system works. So we're going to talk a little bit about that here. So related to that, I want you to read the conclusion section of an editorial piece from Dr. Jordan. I just want you to get the gist of it. You know, if I was asking you to believe this guy, I would insist that you read the whole article. Uh, we're covering a lot of ground here, so I just want you to at least have heard it and to have thought about it. Then, if you see something in his conclusion that strikes you, go back and read the article or and or look for supporting it or challenging ideas online. I think I'm going to center one of our discussion questions on this conclusion, so check it out. I'm going to ask you a little bit about his conclusion, then I'm going to ask about specialization, and then I want you to consider sort of a case study, which is the Myeloma Institute at UAMS. Look at the Myeloma Institute website or anywhere else you find information about it and try to get a sense for how they got started. You know, what was the call for a myeloma institute? Where did that come from? How much money goes to this specialty area? What outcomes do they have to show for that specialization? How many people do they affect? How many people in Arkansas do they affect? How many people in Little Rock? So what I'm trying to get at here is how does a specialty institute like the Myeloma Institute come to exist in Little Rock? I think this case study helps us get at that. And there's nothing against the Myeloma Institute. I really don't know that much about it. I'm going to be looking some stuff up myself. I just know that it's a you know, relatively rare disease that has an institute in Little Rock. So I was wondering where that came from. Now, besides thinking about how these specializations arise and the benefits that come with them, I also want you to think about them in terms of the system, right? Because specialization is kind of like centralization in that wealth and power resources seem to accumulate in in particular areas of the system. And that's what that special specialization is about. And that's not necessarily bad, but you look back to our ecological models, you know, you don't want too much power in any one part of the system, right? So how do we know when a specialization has gone far enough or when centralization has gone far enough? What are the indicators that we look for? What are the things um, that we care about that change? And what can we do about it? Um, devolution, or what I say is devolution, is an interesting concept in systems. It has to do with seeding power away from a higher court towards a lower court or from a more centralized government towards a more local government or away from organizations and systems and towards individuals. It does seem to be happening in all areas of service, including health services. Now, I'm suggesting that you look out for it, though. Think about it and consider some of the possible consequences, good and bad, and, and some of the processes that help us grow a specialization or devolve a specialization as needed. Are we able to do that? Is that something that, this, that we can do consciously, or is that something that just happens? So I think this helps us think about maldistribution, which your book talks about. And it says it's an imbalance of the distribution of health professionals needed to maintain the health status of a given population at an optimal level. What I really want you to do as you read this is think about who defines maldistribution. So it says needed to maintain the health status of a given population at an optimal level. Well. Health's not that clear, is it? Do we know what an optimal level is? Somebody has to define that. And so what I want you to do is question, who's defining that? Who's defining a gap in the access to care? Who defines a lack of access to primary care? Who defines the underserved? Because it ties into this special specialization, right? If the American Medical Association comes out with a statement that 
we need more doctors, and we got to take that with a grain of salt. No offense to physicians, but everybody thinks that their specialty or what they do is really important. But turf issues can affect these perceived gaps as well. So you have some kind of service that could be provided by a physician assistant, a nurse practitioner, or a doctor. Who decides which of those you need there? So who's defining the gaps and who's defining the needs? Your book, I think, talks about a lot of these drivers of the system as if people aren't behind them. And we kind of have to do that if you're taking a systems perspective. We sort of dehumanize the process by talking about factions, factors, components, and sectors. But really, there's somebody behind it. For example, the book says that technology is a driver of, of, in the industry. Well, somebody's behind technology. UAMS has what they call a bioventures company. It's a company that helps mitigate the risk that people who are trying to innovate in healthcare would be facing if they were on their own. So you come through this program at UAMS, they take away some of your risk involved, so you don't have as much on the line, you don't have as much to lose to advance your technology. They show up here. Um, basically, we're a federally funded research uh, facility here. We, we derive a lot of our research income uh, from federal grants, and we have an, your tax dollars. We have an obligation to make sure that if smart guys like you invent things here in the university using those federal dollars, that we do two things with it. One, we report back to the government that these smart guys have generated uh, some intellectual property and we capture that in a patent. And the second thing we do, we, we report that to the government. The second thing that we do uh, with that technologies we try to find a buyer for that technology so if someone has come up with a new cure for cancer or a new device that's important in surgery whatever it is uh, we try and make sure that we've got a proprietary position on that and then we take that to the world and that is the way that the private equity uh, our private capital comes into this intellectual asset so that it grows goes through the FDA, becomes a new therapeutic, a new surgical device. And that is what we call commercialization. So that is what we do. It's unique. We have our own uh, incubator that houses up to 14 companies in it that we help get started with these young technologies. So if I'm Dr. X here at UAMS and I've decided that I want to take my invention and I want to put to a an entrepreneurial group around it, and I want to help bring uh, uh, private dollars to that, investment dollars to that project, and grow that little technology in that business, we help them do that. That's what we do every day. That's actually a very fun job for us, but it creates, it actually creates wealth uh, around that technology, and creating wealth is a very important sort of point to make here. I've gotten in trouble for saying that, but ultimately we have young companies that are every day growing uh, in value because we are taking those technologies through various steps of the FDA. We're taking them through different steps that, that uh, really take the risk out of that to deliver better technologies. So we can't really say that there aren't some decisions being made there about that technology. So if technology drives industry, what drives technology is kind of what I'm, I'm getting at here. So always look for that. Look for who's writing this, what are they, what's their stake in the game. I think this is another subtle but important distinction. You know, a lot of health behavior folks, program managers, program directors, talk about reach and they want to increase the reach of their program. Well that's not the same as filling a gap in services, right? It could be, but not necessarily. And I think motivation matters, I think the orientation matters, and who defines these terms matters. So that's a pretty short lecture on a pretty short part of your book, but I think it's a fundamental part of the book. 
to understand the size and scope of the system that you're going to be working in, to understand your role in the system and the way your profession affects the system. It's also important to understand some of the terms that we discussed here and I want you to be vigilant about who is defining the terms and who do they serve? Who are they looking out for when they suggest that we need changes? In this? So check out the book and meet me up on the discussion board. Tell me what you think about this class and about the content. Anything you think I said that didn't make sense or is wrong, then uh, please let's have a discussion about it. I'm looking forward to it.